Jennifer Steele joins me. She's an associate professor with the School of Education at American University, or AU, just down the street from here. Welcome to the show. Call me a skeptic. Um, four days a week, I, I, if the students, I suppose, are learning the full curriculum over four days, I suppose it's okay, but I got to think that there's one less day uh, of, of learning, right? Well, that's right. And a week ago, we saw national assessment scores, the long-term NAEP assessments came out. Uh, for the first time, this national test had been administered since before COVID, since the year before COVID. And we saw these long-term trends take a dive from school closures. And, and it really was, there's pretty high confidence that this was attributable to the disruptions of COVID. And they took a dive pretty dramatically in math and reading. Um, from these disruptions of the academic year that we saw with hybrid learning. Now, it may not be as severe with a four-day school week because you still have kids going to school in person, but then this also raises questions about child care availability for families. Right. Th there are certainly questions, and I'll just take one particular area. Um, back to school also means for some teachers in some parts of the country, striking. In Seattle, for example, they are striking. No surprise, more money, more benefits, just a better work environment. And there isn't a teacher in the country who doesn't want more money and a better work environment. How are we going to solve this in the long run? Because everything isn't just about money, or am I wrong? In teaching, everything is not just about money because teachers, we know teachers don't go into the profession to get rich. But at the same time, we have a lot of evidence that money makes a difference on the margin. And when we do have widespread teacher shortages due to the great resignation and due to the kind of stress and pressure that was put on teachers when they didn't feel physically safe in the schools and when they were having to teach in hybrid modes that were that were uncomfortable for everyone, uh, with that, we did see a lot of resignations. So when you have not enough teachers to fill classrooms, which is the case in some places, there are two things you can do. You can um, you can raise salaries to attract people. Well, there are actually three. You can improve working conditions, um, and you can find other financial incentives like public service loan forgiveness, which um, there's been a new extension from the Biden administration on this. But the other thing you can do is expand who gets to be a teacher. Um, and some states have tried that. For example, Florida um, has opened a lot of regulations in terms of who gets to teach, even potentially military veterans without bachelor's degrees. And, um, and in terms of being a sub, a, a, high, school, a high school graduate uh, can be a substitute teacher no, in Florida. It, so that's it, another way. That is a super good point because I spoke to the districts that I live nearby about this particular problem. And one of the challenges they said is that all teachers have to have certificates. And how do you get the certificate? Well, obviously, it's a very lengthy process that most of us probably aren't going to do. But I know so many parents who would be more than happy to volunteer their time to teach one or two classes part time. And when this came up, of course, it's against union rules. It's banned. We can't have this. And there's a thousand reasons why that can't be done. And I wonder if we have to take a look at our system in a more holistic way, given the shortage and as you say, have more flexibility. Are we seeing some traction in that? Well, I think you you see some districts that have taken an approach, which is what you're talking about, Phil, a grow your own approach. So it's taking people from the community, parents, people who are connected to local communities, especially uh, non-English speaking communities, communities of color, and said, let's help folks get licensed or they've taken paraprofessionals, teacher assistants, and helped them get licensed. But there is also, there's been a long-term um, trend in terms of shortening the time it takes to get teachers prepared to be in the classroom. Some evidence suggests that some of these teachers, if, they're, if they come from strong academic backgrounds and they go through a rigorous short training process, they end up performing about as well. But this is, it's a pretty fraught question because at the same time, teaching is a tough profession. Relationships between kids and teachers matter. It's about knowing how to teach, but it's also about sticking around, connecting with parents, and getting better over time. So we don't want to completely deprofessionalize teaching because it does drive people out, and, and it leads to churn that's bad for kids. But 
we can think more flexibly about how to get caring, well-prepared adults into classrooms. Yeah, I mean, the point is you're supposed to be, I guess, preparing well, educated students to pass whatever test they need to or prepare them for college or technical school. Um, you know, one of the things that surprises me about this entire situation is the fact that why can't we give teachers a better work environment? I love your idea, by the way, not your idea, it's the White House, I guess, but the idea for giving government loans, providing assistance for teachers to improve their own, you know, education or their own careers, whatever that might, that might be. And these are all things that we should have done earlier on. We should be doing more of it. And I, I don't understand why there's a hesitancy to improve the lives of the people who are educating our blood children, basically, right? I mean, they're educating our children. We should do whatever it takes, like you would for a doctor or a nurse. Well, to tell you the truth, what we had over the last two decades was, I think what we're seeing now is a correction to a policy trend over the last two decades, which was the idea that we need that kids are coming out of school with, uh, there's a tremendous uh, racial ethnic inequity in this country in terms of the, the, the skills with which kids have been prepared to enter the labor market, to, to prepare for college. And so policy said, we got to push teachers harder. We got to have no excuses. And so teachers kind of became the villains in this narrative. And now I think we're starting to see a course correction that says, you know, teachers are, are not the problem. Teachers are working hard. They're part of the solution. We got to take care of them so they can take care of the kids. Je and, Jennifer, and that means you need good leaders. Jennifer, you are 100% right. And I don't know who would disagree with you on this, but I hope more people listen to what you are saying. Jennifer Steele, um, I apologize, we're out of time. Associate Professor, American University. It's uh, fantastic to have you on. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Bill.